out of this place of bless me and into this place of how could I be a blessing? Amen. It needs Amen. to come out of this place of what can you do for me, God, to God? How could I be filled with you? How could I represent yeah. you? And how could right. I know you more? And the more I know you, the more I'm filled with you and the more I just could give you away. Amen. But we, our hearts need to be in this place because the world needs it. Very clear. Hell is a reality. Heaven's a reality. And here's the thing. People are dying and Jesus paid such a high price so they wouldn't. Sorry, man. Hell wasn't because so, God was angry at humanity, but hell was actually because God loved humanity so much they sent his son so they wouldn't have to go there. Right. God was moved and said, no, I can't go there. But here's the thing, like, it, it has to be about Jesus. It can't even, here's the thing, it can't even be about winning souls. Because if it's about winning souls itself, you all of a sudden, you're stepping out of relationship into works. And you're only as good as the last person you saved. That's right. That's right. Uh, what does that look like? You go out and say a whole bunch of people get touched by the love of God, but you didn't see someone say the prayer. So you go home and the devil says you failed and you agree with them like, oh, man, I just failed. I just missed it. I just messed up because like, yeah, they encounter God's love, but they're they're not saved. And all of a sudden you created this system where your value is dependent on what you just did. That's good. But in relationship with God, it's about what, what do you say about this? What are you doing here? Because guess what? Sometimes people will get touched by healing and you won't see them say the prayer. But guess what? You have no idea how deep those seeds go. Sorry, yeah, yeah. I've had people who cussed me out give their lives to the Lord months later. Wow. I've had, I remember this one guy, like, he, like, we're, we went up to, there's these 30 kids that are just partying in the park. And we're going up and God's just healing people left and right. This kid got in a fight. He broke his wrist and we prayed for him. He gets better. This girl's all drunk and she comes up. She's like, why do you love God? <laughs> and I look at her and I shared with her the love of God, but then God, I saw her painting in her room to escape her mom because her mom was really angry at her. And I told her, I said, I feel like God's given you this incredible gift for art. And you do that to hide because your relationship with your mom's not that good. And you, you cannot find peace in your household. So that's your escape. And the way you escape is through art. And I want you to know that God sees that. And he's with you in those moments. And he gave you that gift. And he's like, I feel his pleasure when you're using it. She's breaking down, bawling and crying like, what the heck is wrong with you? Like, what is going on? And I'm like, it's Jesus. He loves you. Yeah. It's the love of God, and she couldn't take it. She ran away. So, so all of a sudden, there's this, uh, there's this guy, you know, and he's just really cocky, really, you know, outspoken. He comes up and said, "Man, I just stored a line of coke, and my nose is burning. Why don't you pray for my nose?" Oh my God. I'll take it. <laughs> I don't care. I look for opportunities to pray. I don't care if it's something completely crazy. I'll just use it. So I prayed for his nose. I'm like, Father, I thank you. All pain go. In Jesus' name. <laughs> Didn't work. I knew this was blank and fake. I'm like, let me pray again. Pray it again. Blah, blah, blah. It starts cussing me out even more. I knew this was fake. Now he's like getting a scene, telling everyone around him what a fake I am. And he's just mocking me. And how many knows? Like, that is really easy to see something like that and inside be like, wow, this really isn't working. <laughs> Now, here's the thing. If your value is dependent on what you do, you're going to see that and be crushed by it. Yeah. And you're like, man, it's not work. And then you miss the glory that's going to happen later on because you wow. shut yourself down. Amen. But what happens if you just choose? It's not about that, but it's about him. Yeah. It's not about like, I don't heal, like healing people. I, it's a byproduct of this. Yes. And if they don't get healed, it's not going to stop because I know him. So here's the thing. He just cusses me out and he walks away. And then later on, like, this guy, like, had a messed up rib. And this other guy, like, he's like, we showed him a video of someone getting healed, like, on my video camera. And he's like, I knew this was real. I was praying. I was praying, God, I want to believe in you. I just need evidence. And then you come along and you show me this video. I know this is real. And then we're like, hey. And then we're like, come here. So we have him pray for this guy and his rib gets healed. 
and goes back in place through his prayers, and he's tripping out even more now. So now he's just a brand new believer who just gets rocked by the presence of God, and he's just like on fire. If I would have been discouraged there, if it would have been about results, I would have lost it at that point where the guy was mocking me, yeah. and I wouldn't have seen that guy come to the Lord. That's right. That's right. Does that make sense? That's so good. We cannot be based on works because what happens if nothing happens? Here's the thing. If it's based on relationship, it doesn't matter. It's about him, not that. A year later, that I see that guy who mocked me. And he walks up to me. He says, hey, man, could you pray for my girlfriend and I? I'm trying to get off drugs. And, like, and he looks at his girlfriend and says, this is the guy I was talking about. This guy prayed for me a year ago in the park, and I got healed. I'm like, what? <laughs> okay. So we prayed for him to get off drugs, and he's just rocked and humbled, and like his wow. whole, who he was was a totally different person. Wow. Amen. Love that. Like, that's crazy. Wow. But here's the thing. You can't judge it by what you see. You judge it by him, and he works things out. He's really good at it. But we, we have such a privilege, we get to know Him. Our sufficiency is Him. Amen. Everything we need is in Him. Amen. And when it's all about Him, then it's not about results or not about what method you use or this or that. But you get to know Him and you're able to hear Him in the moment. Amen. Like, one way I'm learning and I'm growing and sharing the gospel is I'll ask God where people are at. Most of the time, God just tells me. But show me if they grew up in a Christian home and they got beat down with the gospel so much they ran from it. Or he'll show me if they've never heard the gospel or right where they're at with God. I love that because then you're coming in not with a one track fits all, but you could actually connect to the heart of God and speak right where they're at. That's good. Yeah. So good. Now that comes from relationship. That comes from knowing God. And yeah. it's not about your, your prayer time before a meeting, but it's about living your life in prayer. Yeah. It's about connecting to Him. Here's the thing. It's not about how much you read the Bible, but it's about how much you engage with God in it. That's good. This Bible is pointless if you don't find God in it. That's right. If you do not connect to God, this book's not going to do you any good. Yeah, that's right. This thing has to connect to Him through Spirit. That's right. But it's all about Him. Everything. <laughs> Listen to this. It's Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. It says, Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy, through empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, and not according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. You know, there's a lot of, I've heard a lot of weird teachings and a lot of stuff come in where it's almost like you need Jesus and you need to do this and this and this. And what they do is they add works to the simplicity that's in Christ. Yeah. And it makes sense because our natural mind feeds. We're like, oh, yes, this makes sense. Finally, a step I could get closer to God. You know? I, we've had to correct a lot of people and like, deal with a lot of stuff because we have people coming in from all different places. So we deal with this regularly. But what it is is I realize how the demonic comes in is it adds things on to the simplicity that's in Christ. And it says you need Christ plus this. Yeah. You're not complete until you have Christ, plus you do this kind of work, or this, or this, or this. Right. But right here it says, beware, people are going to try to cheat you that way. Don't. Wow. It's about Christ. That's right. it. Now here, it says, for in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Yes. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Did you hear that? He's the head of all principality and power. That means we don't have to pull down strongholds and principalities before we have Christ. Yeah. We have Christ and that stuff falls. We don't have to like, do all these works and extra things. We get to know him. Yeah. And here's the thing. I believe in Christian discipline. Like That's amazing. I believe in reading the Bible. I believe in praying. But it's about connecting to God through those things. That's right. That's right. If you don't connect to Jesus, like why? It, it just works. Right. <laughs> I love it. and here's the thing our hearts need to be postured in worship in a relationship with God there's this thing called worship which we're doing a lot of it and hopefully we're still doing it because it doesn't shut off when music stops yeah, that's right. That's right. 
Music helps you focus. That's right. It takes you and says, hey, let's take a second and focus on God through singing. And then your heart's engaged with God. Your heart's open. You're dancing. You're celebrating God. But what happens when the music stops? Is your heart still in that place? Or do you just say, check out and say, okay, that's over with. Yeah. What's in front of me now? Yeah. That's good. What if we stayed in this place of worship where our heart is constantly exalting God, where we're so overwhelmed with Him, where we're in adoration of Him, and the praise and the worship and the glory doesn't stop in our heart? When the music stops, we're still like, Jesus, it's about you. You know, most of my prayer life is actually praising Him and worshiping Him and, and thanking Him. It's just like, God, you're amazing. We love you. Jesus, you're worthy. And here's the thing. When we go out witnessing on the streets, it's the same thing. It's just, it's about him. We focus on him. He's everything. Yeah. When our focus is on him, all of a sudden, what's in front of me is not as big. Amen. Amen. How many of you have felt overwhelmed by certain areas or certain things? All of a sudden, it's like, Whoa, I don't know if I think I could. I can't handle this. Or it just seems like the devil has a hold so big here that it feels hopeless. When you look at the situation, it looks hopeless. But when God is in the picture, that, like when you're looking at him, the problems are pretty small. Yeah. It's about him. Jesus is our all sufficiency. So when we're in him and focus on him, we come across a problem. All of a sudden, it's like, boom. An explosion. That's good. You know, it's funny because did you notice it's harder to pray in crisis than it is like when you yeah. Yeah. ever wonder why that is? It's because all of a sudden now we need something. We need an answer. So we start putting all our effort towards getting that answer and instead of all our effort towards knowing him. I'm not saying like pressing into God and praying and like fasting and seeking after God is important. And here's the thing. You do get breakthrough that way. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is if we're not living a lifestyle in that, it's hard when all of a sudden you need it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like Jesus cast out. There's that guy the disciples tried casting a demon out of. And they couldn't do it. So Jesus comes up and he's like. You perverse generation. Per, the word perverse doesn't mean like perverted, but it actually means their thinking is twisted and the way they're perceiving the situation is twisted. Yeah. He's saying you're seeing this wrong. Yeah. You're, you're, what you see in the situation is off. He said, then he says, it, why couldn't we cast it out? Because of your unbelief. But this kind doesn't come out through prayer and fasting. Now, Jesus modeled the Christian life. He showed us what, what it looks like to be fully surrendered to God. And I didn't see Jesus pray and fast an hour before he cast that thing up. <laughs> well, where did that come from? He prayed and fasted on the mountaintops. Then he yeah. came across that situation. And he was able to deal with it. Yeah. Here's the thing. We get to know God. We seek after him. We fa fasting is important, but if fasting doesn't connect you to his heart, it's pointless. Yeah. It's just words. It's about him. Is yeah. this making sense? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. Now, how do we how do we get hungry for the things of God? Like there's that it's interesting, there's this paradox in that that passage. It says you're filled with the fullness of God. It's like, oh I'm filled with the fullness of God. Well, what keeps me from like why should I press in for God? Why should I get to know him? Why should I hunger after him if I'm already filled? You could have a refrigerator full of the best foods, but you're not going to eat of anything unless you're hungry for it. Now, here's the thing. How do you get hungry for God? You start tasting the things of heaven. You start tasting his goodness. You start seeing who he is. And the more you get to know him, the more you want him. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, man, God, my prayer is to know you more. Yeah. I have to see you. I have to know who you are, God, because yeah. you're everything. You're amazing. And I love that because when it's about Jesus, miracles have a place where you're actually, you're able to celebrate a miracle because it points you to him. You see someone get healed, and you're not like, oh, another miracle. You're really like, Jesus, he did that. <laughs> you 
But God is incredibly relational. Like, here's something amazing. Like, he actually loves you. Do you know God's not invested in a relationship just for your obedience? Like, my kids, you know, I have four kids. It would be really, really nice if they obeyed. <laughs> Bedtime. Okay, shh, go to bed. Awesome. Yay. No wrestling, no fighting, peace. <laughs> you know, but my relationship with my kids is not about obedience. The point of me having kids is not so I could have four little soldiers that obey. So what do you value, like, in relationships? What, what do I value with my kids? I love when my daughter sits on my lap and she's like, she's just the cutest thing, you know? You tell her, you're like, you're a princess. She's like, I know. <laughs> my son, Zakai, you know, he's the warrior. He's the one who's, like, fighting bad guys with the fake sword and, like, just, like, all around the house. And, like, but I love his affection. I love him spending time with me. My son Hayden, like, have you guys, you guys heard that game Minecraft? He'll build these yeah. extravagant, crazy worlds on Minecraft, and he's just like a puzzle solver, and the way yeah. he thinks is like patterns and design. He's like incredible, and he'll show me this, like, he'll make his own challenges where you have to jump to here and jump to here and get to here, and he's like so proud of himself, and like, look what I did, Dad, look, 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 and you go through, and he's just like so excited showing me what he has done. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I start taking enjoyment in him because it's like, wow, that's incredible. That's amazing. And that affection, that connection is actually what drives our relationship, our friendship with them. Yeah. Yes, there has to be obedience. They're my kids. They need to obey. If I'm in a store, they actually have to listen <laughs> or they're going to the car to wait, you know? Obedience is important. We need to obey God. If God says something, we have to obey it. But our relationship with God is not just obedience. That's right. But it's intimate connection. It's being vulnerable. It's heart-to-heart -heart relationship with the living God. Right. Where we're like, God, you love me. Yes. I'm loved by Him. Yes. That's why Ephesians. Paul prays that we would be rooted and grounded in love. Yes. Yes. Rooted, meaning... Love is the place where we get all the nutrients we need out of our life. It's the love of God that actually keeps us healthy, keeps us restored, feeds us, helps us grow. It's in that place that we're rooted. But I like it says rooted and grounded because if you guys ever pushed it, but like pushed over a giant tree, can you do it? Like there's a giant tree with really healthy roots and you're just like, it's not going to go over. So we're supposed to be rooted and grounded in the love of God, the affection of God. I love this that Love is actually emotional. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Love is not this weird abstract concept that, you know, we just, you know, I, I like, I, don't, I love you, but I don't like you. I don't like spending time. That's garbage. See, Jesus was moved with compassion. Like that means something in his heart drove him to heal multitudes. There's an emotion he felt that actually caused him into moving for someone else. That's right. Now, how do we get this? It says love's poured out in our heart by the Holy Spirit whom he's given us. So when you're filled with the Spirit, you get to know him, you spend time with him, you get filled with his presence. It's he is love. So love just fills your heart for other people. Okay. Now here's the thing: God is highly affectionate. He's amazing. And it's really scary because if you're like like, I know, especially for guys, like, we're taught, like, we don't, we can't show emotion, except excitement or anger, but, like, that, that crying love emotion, it's kind of weird. We don't want to show that. You guys know what I'm talking yeah. about? Like, I can't tell you how many times I start bawling in, in church because all of a sudden God's presence starts hitting me, and I can't help it. Tears are streaming out, and I'm just like, and then part of my mind goes, I hope nobody's watching. I hope nobody's looking. But now I'm just like, I'm getting to the point, I don't care about him. It's about Jesus. I'm in love with him. <laughs> No, relationship with God, a friendship with God, it actually means communication. It actually means opening your heart and being vulnerable to Him. 
communicating with him, where you actually allow him to influence your heart and touch your heart. Yes, yes, yes. You know, the Israelites like had an opportunity to know God. They had an opportunity to like Moses went up to the mountain and they're like, all right, that's freaky. The mountain's thundering, God's scary. Moses, how about how's this? Moses, check this out, check this out. Go in here. You go talk to the scary God, ask him what he wants us to do, and then come back and tell us and we'll do whatever you say. That's right. We don't want to talk to God, you go. Yep. So Moses goes up and all right, God, like, what's your law? What's your commandments? They don't want a relationship with you. They want a relationship with the law. It's easier. We have to, a list of do's and don'ts. And then if we have this list of do's and don'ts, then we'll automatically do the right thing. But here's the thing. We need a relationship with God to empower us to do the right thing. Because you can do nothing in your own strength. That's right. So he comes down with the law and like golden calf. He's just like, dude, I was gone like two seconds. And... See, the Old Testament, you have this intense relationship with God because the relationship was law-based. They couldn't even see who God was because I have a question. If you're, if you're, say you're sitting in a courtroom and you're guilty, right? And the judge is sentencing you to death, but it was a crime you rightfully deserved by the court of law that you live in. You're not thinking that judge is a good, compassionate person, are you? Yeah. You're like, man, he's out to get me. What's happened? So under the law, you look at God through the lens of your own sin, and then you cannot see, you see a harsh, angry God because you see this standard that you're supposed to live up to, and you see where you fall short. Sorry. You see, I missed it here, I missed it here. God, your standard's so perfect, and I'm not, and this and that. That's right. See, that's the Old Testament. Or their relationship with God was in this weird place because they had to obey these commandments. And he, he lives by one, but you have to live by all of them. And if you miss one, you're guilty of all. And it's a harsh standard, but you know what? If you want to do this on your own strength, without God in you, without God for you, this is what you get. Yeah. Yeah. See, we were created for intimacy with God. I love how in the garden there wasn't really a, a law except don't eat a tree. <laughs> God created Adam and said, hey, just don't eat this tree because bad things are going to happen. Yeah. It's going to give you knowledge of good and evil, and it's going to cause death. You don't want that. Don't touch that. <laughs> I love how Adam was actually born without a sin nature either. Yeah. He, like God didn't like create him and say, you know what, let's make Adam really twisted here and like Thing, believe lies here and let's make let's make Adam's heart utterly wicked who could trust it you know what I'm saying yeah. 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 so but that shows that a sin nature is actually like Adam wasn't born with a sin nature well that you don't need a sin nature to sin you just need the ability to believe a lie and free will to act on it yes. so that was a liar yeah. so good so good and it's amazing how in Romans it says the law gives you knowledge of sin but condemns you. Yeah. Think about it. The law gives you a knowledge of good and evil but it condemns you to death because you can't measure up to it. That's right. The tree gave you knowledge of good and evil but the fruit of it is death. That's right. Now there are tree, two trees in the garden you could eat from. You could eat from this tree of good and evil and do it yourself. It's your independence from God. See, when the devil tempted Eve, he came up and he said, you know what? Eat this tree. You'll be like God. Wait, she was already like God. It said like God created man in his image. So the temptation was not just to be like God, but it was to be like God, independent from him. Wow. To be separated from God. To say, you know what? Cutting off this relationship. I'm walking away. See, we were made to be filled with God. We are made to be a house with God. I believe Adam and Eve were filled with the Spirit of God. They were created that way. He breathed in them. How could yes. his breath not be the Holy yes. Spirit? Yes. How could he breathe anything other than his spirit? That's right. That's right. So they were filled. They were, they were the first Pentecostals. <laughs> <laughs> they knew God. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. Good. But they got independent from God. The... Yeah. Now here's the thing. There was this other tree that they were supposed to eat on that gives us everlasting life. You know, there's 
this other system other than the law that actually brings life because the law was a ministry of death and condemnation. It's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. But there's a ministry of righteousness, a ministry where you eat of this fruit and instead of condemning you, it makes you righteous. Yeah. You realize Jesus became your sin on the cross that you might become his righteousness here and now. What that means, is it says the handwritten requirements of the law was nailed to the cross. Meaning Jesus lived out that standard, that impossible standard to live up to. And it was never actually meant to complete except by Jesus. You were never meant to live up to the standard of the law. But you are meant to live up in him, in relationship. So Jesus fulfilled these requirements of the law. Died on a cross. See, it says if you don't do the things of the law, it's death. So he lived this life and he, the handwritten requirements he fulfilled. Then he died on the cross and he said, you know what? I'm paying the penalty for this. Guess what? This is done. This is done away with. See, the cross was the start of something new. That's why Jesus said a brand new commandment I give you. That you love others like I love you. Now that doesn't seem complicated. God just took the whole law and made it a hard issue. Yes, he did. What does that actually mean? That means instead of not committing adultery, now it's not lusting out of that woman in your heart. Yeah. Now it's instead of not murdering, it's actually not being wrongfully anger, angry at people in your heart. God took this and condensed it to a hard issue. Yes. And here's the thing. You can't live that out yourself. You actually need God living inside you. <laughs> but here's the thing. It's, well, how do we get this love? Love's poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. How do we get the Holy Spirit? Him. Yeah. He fills us. The more we know Him, the more He fills us. The more He changes us. The more we get filled with His love and the more love just pours out. So good. So good. Is this making sense? Oh, yeah. awesome. I get excited about this because... Yeah. <laughs> Like, do you want, really want to know God in relationship? Yeah. Like, I believe the, the number one key is love. Let's go to John chapter, 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Does God have wrath? Yes. God can get angry. God can smite people. But it nowhere does it say God is wrath. That's right. That's good. That's good. That's good. It does say God is love. And you yeah. notice it doesn't say God is loving. Yeah. Love's not an attribute of his character, but the very essence of who he is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Does, that, does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Meaning the core essence of everything that God is, is filled in this one word, love. Yes. And it's God who brings definition to what love is, not... Because <laughs> we can have this worldly twisted love, and it doesn't look like God's love. It looks like viewing people as their brokenness, and accepting them as their brokenness. It's okay, you're just messed up. and That's not love. Love goes in the darkness and pulls you out of your brokenness. Yeah. Love lays down its life so you're not caught in that place okay. anymore. Love looks like dying on a cross for you so you're not condemned to death. It's amazing this whole image of God thing. Because God is love. And we're created in the image of God. So you're created. The purest form of you showing the image of God is found in loving people. And it's a godly kind of love. It's that love that motivates you to be a blessing to people. That moves you. That moves your heart. When you see an issue, you're like, wow, like, I have to do something about this. If so you want a friendship with God, it starts with love. And listen to this. So John, chapter, actually, 
1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, what does love actually look like? You know, a lot of people read this passage like, okay, this is what I need to do. But if God is love, these are attributes of his character. It says, verse 4, love suffers long. God suffers long for you. What does that actually mean? That means when you're caught in sin, when you're dead in your trespasses, when you're living a life contrary to God, he suffers long. And instead of judging you in your sin, he goes in the darkness to deliver you out of it. See, we grieve the Holy Spirit because he doesn't leave us. If, if he left us, we wouldn't grieve. It would be kind of like, okay, I'm out of here. But the reason why we grieve him is because when we sin and we're filled with the Spirit, we're taking the most holy and precious thing and running it through the dirt. But God suffers long and is kind. Love is kind to people. It says it's the kindness of God that leads people to repentance. It's not the anger and wrath of God that leads people to repentance. Israel, that didn't work out to them. Like they didn't. You know. <laughs> I feel this. Well, she's going to wait on that one. I just felt something really is. Holy Spirit, more. <laughs> <laughs> There's this song by Amanda Cook that says, You are not a tyrant king. You are kind. Meaning God's not this overbearing, demanding thing that, you know, when you follow him, you gotta follow him, or he's gonna judge you, he's gonna smite you, he's gonna it's your life's gonna be a living hell unless you're no. Oh. Here's the truth. He's kind to you. And he loves you. And he's patient. He's long-suffering. You know, when my son's putting together a puzzle, I do, don't get angry with him when he doesn't get all the pieces right. My daughter's trying to learn puzzles, you know, so it's been a patient thing. <laughs> but she's like, Tries to force this picture, this one into this one. The picture doesn't match. But it's like, good job, good job. <laughs> He's kind. He doesn't envy. He doesn't pray to self. And he's not puffed up. You know, God is so humble. A lot of times the way he speaks is so low you have to shut off the voices of the world to hear him. Because he doesn't raise his voice over the noise or over the world or over the devil or this or that. He just speaks low. Sometimes they'll be loud to warn you. They'll like get you if you're like ready to jump off a cliff he could be loud. But you know what? When our hearts are postured in the place where we our focus is on him all of a sudden we start hearing him clear. Why? He's not going to pray to himself. He's not going to puffed up like, look at me! <laughs> it's funny how the devil does that. The devil really wants attention. I think deliverance, when it comes to people actually manifesting physically, that's just a show to show you, like, the devil's like, look at me! <laughs> Who cares? It's about God. The devil loves to show off how much darkness he has and how much bondage people are in. Like we go, we go to some areas in Portland, some areas where you just go there, you feel the demonic all around. And the devil loves to flail his face and like, look, look how oppressed people are. And when the devil gets your focus, all of a sudden it's like, you get overwhelmed and helpless. But then God becomes your focus. Then it's like, oh, who cares? Okay. Well, here's the thing. God's not puffed up like that. We seek after God. We find Him. He doesn't behave rudely. Unless you count spinning people's eyes sometimes. But, <laughs> but He's not rude. Well, what does that mean? Like, He actually cares about what you feel. Sometimes He'll push you out of the boundaries and He'll, like, do something that'll totally offend your mind, yeah? 
but he's not like some people are, you know, in your face. Like, you have to do this and this and this and this. He's patient. He's like, hey, come alongside me. He's not provoked. Thinks no evil. Do you know God doesn't think evil about you? What if we actually believe that? <laughs> How would our relationship would be if we're, if half our prayer life wasn't, God, I remember I, I mess up here. I've done this wrong. I've done this. God's like, what are you talking about? I said, I remember your sins no more. Why are you reminding me? <laughs> like, I love this because when we go to God, like God's not thinking evil of you or not thinking, well, Never like that's the voice of the devil. God actually hopes about you. He believes in you more than you believe about yourself. And here's the thing: He knows you could actually do all things because it's Him who gives you the grace and powerful. Like, like it's Him who gives you grace to make you powerful to do whatever He's called you to do. It's His power that actually empowers you. So why is He? He's not looking at you like, oh, they're telling you they're never going to make it. They're never going to get this right. He's looking at you saying, look, I have everything you need. I have all the grace you need, all the love you need, everything you need. I am your all-sufficient one. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. I love that. When we approach God, like, we don't... I remember one time I was like trying to do a self-deliverance and I was searching for all these doors I opened and every, you know, like we've been there. <laughs> Where I, I remember like I had this deliverance book and I'm going through this list of demons, naming all the demons and seeing if anything might matter. You know, I'm like, I'm searching every nook and cranny of my life for any hook that could be there and it's so funny because my focus was so much on the hooks, I was seeing the hooks everywhere. I remember when I came to God, I'm like, God, remember when I did this, remember when I did this, remember when I did this, and he showed me a picture of a blank page. He's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh. <laughs> I love that. So when you approach God, God's completely in love with you. The first foundation of friendship with God, I believe, is love. Just knowing His love, being your heart being open to Him. And it, it could be romantic, it could be amazing, it could be a friendship, it could be this father son relationship yeah. that's just intimate and deep and real. That's right. God doesn't love you for what you could do for Him. Let me say that again. I want you to really take that in. God does not love you because of how, what you could do for Him. He loves you because He knows who you are. He created you in His image. You are actually created in the image of God. And He looked at you and He saw value and He said, that's worth dying for. It's for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Not for God was so angry with the world or God wanted to like, Argh! it's for God so loved the world. Meaning he looked at you and said, I love that person. He's worth dying for. He's worth everything. Heaven went bankrupt for you. You're precious. You're valuable. You're amazing. You're so valuable the God of the universe would give up everything for you. Would step off his throne, become a human being and live a perfect life that you were supposed to live. And then die on a cross and says, hey, I want to give you everything I deserved. I want to give it to you. And I don't believe Jesus was my, sub like, he wasn't just my substitution, but he actually died as me on the cross. Meaning that cross was my death and my resurrection with him. That means that when Jesus died, he became my sin, not covered my sin. That means who I was before I knew the Lord is on that cross crucified, and who I am now is in the resurrection. Come on. Now it's a friendship with God. Here's the thing. Like, we need to know him. Now, you're created in God's image in the beginning. That image got messed up, but God's image is love. 
because it says God is love. That means Jesus is walking, talking love. It says Jesus is the express image of God. Jesus is the picture of what love looks like. Well, what does the love look like? Love looks like being in a place and seeing people in front of them and being moved with compassion to heal the sick, to feed the multitudes. And here's the thing. You're like, well, I don't have the resources that Jesus... Yeah, you do. You have the Holy Spirit. You have God living in you. Everything Jesus carried lives in you. I think the issue is not... We need to know what we have. Yeah. Yeah. No, here's the thing. Like, if we seek after God, there is a more of God. Like, I know people get caught in, like, this hyper-grace message where it's almost like... More, the why, why seek after more when I'm already full? I already have all. Like, I can't have... Well, you could actually have more of what it is is you get filled more. You get, you get to know Him more. You get to see Him more. Yes. More of Him manifests through your life. Yes. There is a more in God. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. I love that because He's infinite. <laughs> so you can be filled and overflowing and there's still more. Yes. You can know Him more. You can see Him move more. I want more. I could be on the ground getting electrocuted screaming, I want more, go. Because <laughs> there is more. <laughs> but here's the thing, we what if more looks like enjoying what we have but also seeking him for more? Yeah. Using what we have but seeking him for more. What if revival looks like using what God's given us and poured out to us, but also seeking Him for more? What if friendship with God looks like us living out what He pours into and living a relationship here, but daily seeking Him for more? Like, God, I need more. I need more of you, God. Here's the thing. There's that thing that says, blessed are the poor in spirit. What does poor in spirit mean? You're so dependent on him, you can do. You cannot function without him. Poor in spirit means where you are dependent on God in everything. Where God is in every area of your life. You're like, God, I cannot function without you here. I have to have you here. John 15, verse 12. It says, this is my commandment, that you love one another just as I loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for his friends. And you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Jesus showed the greatest form of love in which we were all guilty, and he took our guilt. He went to the cross and got mocked and spit on and beat and broken. And, and he said, that it's for the joy set before me right there sitting I don't think the joy, it, he was talking about the cross being the joy, but what's on the other side? Yes. He saw you restored. Right. The cross was not a joyful thing because he was so burdened with it. He actually yes. sweated tears of blood and sweat of blood where he was so overwhelmed with the epitome of being overwhelmed with stress and anxiety and like just knowing what's coming on him. And he says, you know what, Father, your will be done. Yes. Yes. That's right. You know, Jesus actually experienced temptation. It says he was tempted at all points in Hebrews. Everything he did, right. though he was God, he did it as a man fully surrendered to God. That's right. What that means is he had this body, he had the same cravings, he had the things we go through. He lived this life. He lived it perfectly, but it says he was tempted at all points. Right. I believe, you know what's the craziest temptation? Can you imagine going to cross and knowing just one word you could wipe everyone out? People spitting on you, hitting on you, calling, mocking you, saying you're a king and pulling out your beard. And you having the ability and authority to take up your own life and say no. Yeah. Yeah. She said no man takes my life. I lay it down yeah. willingly. That's it right. was impossible for people to kill him. That's right. Right. Yes. They didn't just kill God. God laid his life down. Yes. He did it willingly. Now here's the love of God. He did that for you. He says, you're worth it. Yes. Now, and it's amazing because he tells us to love like this, and the disciples have no idea what he's about to do. 
<laughs> he's getting ready. You know, he broke communion. He's like, this is my body. This is my blood. I want you to love people like I'm, I'm loving you. I'm no one, you know, like you lay down your life for your friends. Now check this out. No longer do I call you servants for a servant doesn't know what his master's doing. But I've called you friends for all the things I heard from my father. I made known to you. Do you hear that relationship shift? No longer do I call you my servant. I call you my friend. Why? Because when you're busy serving me, you're not hearing me. But if in a friendship with me, you could hear what I want. You could hear my plans and my intentions and my heart. And you could release them. Now think about the Old Testament. You could see this severe contrast of servants and friends. Servants could lose their place when they mess up. Friends don't. That's right. That's right. Servants fall under judgment if they don't abide by the rules. Friends receive mercy, grace, and even strength to go back to a rightful place. That's right. David did things in the law that should have gotten guilt. But God looked, forgave his transgression, and restored him to kingship. Sorry. By the law, he should have been killed. So what's going on? He entered in a friendship with God. Where God said, no, that's my friend. Saul didn't value the relationship with God, but he valued what he looked like to people. Here's the thing. He had the same Holy Spirit fall on him. It says the Holy Spirit fell on him and he became a new man in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 10. So he became a new man when the Holy Spirit saw. He was a new man at one time. Wow. He was filled with the Spirit at one time. He knew God at one time. He didn't value relationship with God and he did everything by works. And guess what? He lost his place. Wow. But I love that because in the New Covenant, Jesus says, no longer do I call you servants, I call you friends. If you love one another, like I love you, I'm calling you my friends. That's amazing. That means we actually actually enter in a friendship with God. And it's not about the list of do's and don'ts, and I should have done this, or I could have done that, but it's actually, we get to know God. We get to see Him, we get to hear from Him. Isaiah 58 says, Is this not the fast I've chosen, that you loose bonds of wickedness, that you let undo heavy burdens, let the oppressed go free, that you break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring your house to the poor who are cast out? And when you see the naked, that you cover them and not hide yourself from your own flesh. See, everything listed there is an act of love. It's an actual action of love. Because love is, it's, it's a feeling, but it's also an action. Love is an emotion. It's, it's so, it's, if it doesn't drive you to do something about it, how's that love? Yeah. Like if you see someone need and you're not actually driven to meet that need, that's, that's not love. That's right. So good. <laughs> but it says, this is the fast I've chosen. This is Old Testament too, which yeah. is amazing because this has always been God's heart. See, God didn't have this personality switch at the New Testament. <laughs> this angry, demanding God, but now Jesus came, so he's nice and loving. No, God's always been God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He has always been love from the beginning, from the get-go. God's nature never changed. His heart's never changed. And the whole Bible is a pursuit, a love relationship where he was looking for mankind to restore them. That's why Jesus died before... The New Testament was written. No, it says he died before the foundation of the world. Now listen to this. Then your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall speed forth speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. And the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Meaning, we don't have to chase the glory. It actually chases us when we love. You want to see God's presence change things? Love the person in front of you. Get to know him. Then God's glory is just going to follow you. It just happens. You'll accidentally cast out demons. (laughs) You'll accidentally heal people. 
It was funny, during worship, there was this lady I prayed for like 15 times and she did not get healed. Like, it was like, every time I see her, she has horrible back pain. And my son Haven's just like goofing off and he's dancing and touching people, being annoying. And then he, he touched her back and walks away and she comes up to me. She's like, your son just touched my back. I'm like, okay, I'm sorry he does that, you know. It's like, no, as soon as he did, I'm healed. She's like, I have no pain and I've been dancing all service. Like, he touched my back and I'm completely better. <laughs> See, the glory of the Lord, like, it's your rear guard. You don't have to chase God. You don't have to chase his power, his presence. To, I mean, you don't have to chase him to do things. But you, you chase to know him and love the person in front of you and the things come. It's just a byproduct. It's yes. power. You know, it's the children's bread. <laughs> it says, then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and I'll say, here I am. Do you hear that? Then, if it, like the promises of God are actually conditional. <laughs> like there is conditions where we have to have our life position in order for the promises of God to manifest. Right. Wow. This isn't about works, but it's about... All things work out for the good of those who love God and those who are called according to His purpose. Yes. You notice that four. Uh -huh. It doesn't say all things work out for the good because really bad stuff happens. Really messed up stuff happens and it's not always for the good. It always, it, sometimes it gets worse and worse and worse until light comes in that area. But for someone who's in love with God and is called according to His purpose... There's the position, there's the requirement. All of a sudden, everything starts working out for the good, and the devil could throw his best at you yeah. and hit you with the hardest, yeah. evilest stuff, and then all of a sudden, God takes it and flips it around for good. Yes. It doesn't mean you're not going to suffer. Go yes. through stuff. What it means, whatever you go through, there's victory at the end. Yes. Yes. Whatever you go through, God can take and he flips. Yes. Yes. Woo. So good. But here's the thing. With this, there's a... Position is to love people in a real way. Now, what does it look to tangibly love somebody? It looks like, you know, paying for someone's groceries behind you, but it also looks like you see someone sick, you pray for them to be healed. Yeah. Sometimes it looks like raising the dead or mourning with someone who's lost a loved one. Yeah. Sometimes it looks, you know, yeah. but what does love actually look like? There's an action with it. Love has to look like something. It has to manifest through our life. But here's the thing. If we live our lives for love in a relationship with God, then this, there's a promise there. It says, your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall speed forth speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. And the glory of the Lord shall be in your rear guard. Yes. Wow, wow, wow. Then you should call and the Lord will answer. He will cry and he'll say, here I am. And what exactly is the glory of the Lord? You know, like Moses, you know, when, when he told them that God's going to manifest manna and quail, he said, in the morning you'll see the glory of the Lord. And the glory of the Lord showed up like a cloud and it manifested the provision of God. Wow. Moses was, in Exodus 33, he goes in the tabernacle meeting. And then glory shows up. And I love that Moses encountering the presence of God. It said God would show up and talk to Moses as a man would speak to as his friend. Yes. Let's go there real quick. Yes. How am I doing on time, by the way? Oh, you got all the time. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to be here till Sunday night. So. Solid. <laughs> So Exodus 33, verse 9, it came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle and the pillar of clouds descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses. All the people saw the pillar of the clouds standing at the tabernacle door and all the people rose and worshiped each one in his tent. So the Lord spoke with Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. And he would return to the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. There's a couple things I want to point out here. 
Number one, Moses engaged the presence of God. Yes. Yes. What are you doing when you're worshiping? You're engaging the presence of God. You're engaging Him. You're opening yeah. your heart to Him. You're enjoying Him. You're seeking Him. You're finding Him. Yeah. You, you ever notice that, like, how many of you get visions when you worship, or yeah. like God speaks to you the most? All of a sudden, you're in a worship service, and then God downloads something yeah. crazy, and you're just like, "What? Yeah, that's only supposed to happen during the teaching. What are you doing? You're out of line. You know, no, what's going on? You're engaging God, and He's yeah. hitting you with His glory, and all of a sudden, He's manifesting something. Right. Right. Here's the thing. So Moses is encountering the presence of God, and God actually considered. Moses encountering that face to face. Yeah, wow. What is the presence of God? It is actually Holy Spirit in a tangible form. It's God Himself becoming real, becoming manifest. Yeah. And I love how it looks different. Sometimes, like, oh man, when we're in Brazil, we're seeing people like hit the ground and like straight up break dancing. They're getting hit with the Holy Spirit so hard. <laughs> Vibrating on the floor or weeping, crying, God just making a mess of the place. But I've seen other people just overwhelmed with peace where the burdens get lifted. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen some people like, you know, cry and shake because the fear of the Lord hits them. But other people, wow. they start feeling the joy and they can't stop laughing because right. like, <laughs> in his presence is the fullness of joy. Rabbit this is a little bit of rabbit trail, but I think Jesus was incredibly joyful. Oh, <laughs> I mean, yes. If the fullness of joy is in the presence of God, I mean, Jesus was the presence of God. <laughs> I don't see. I don't think Jesus was depressed as some of the Jesus movies show. Thank you, Father, for this break. <laughs> I don't think he was emotionless. People loved being around him. He was, yes. a, he was a fun guy to be around. That's right. <laughs> he lives in you. <laughs> but here's the thing. Like, oh, man. I love this because right after that, you know, it says, then Moses, or lay back up. So Moses would go and he would get instruction. Then he'd go tell the people. But Joshua, the son of Nun, he chilled in the presence of God. It said he stayed behind. And he said, you know what? That's awesome. You have, like, God gave you work to do. He gave you instruction. But I'm going to stay right here in the glory. I'm going to stay in the presence. You know what's amazing is people worship God, but they did not engage in his presence. Yeah. So they saw Moses engage with the presence. And they're like, awesome. You go, Moses. Yeah. You engage with God. Listen, we'll just do what you say. We don't want relationship with God. We want. Yeah. Yeah. I believe that's actually what qualified Joshua. You know? Yes. It's funny. When we're engaging God and we're engaging the presence of God and we start seeing him for who he is, it changes our perspective. It's like the 12 spies that went over to look at Israel, look at the land. Like Joshua and Caleb, like, come on, let's go. Like, there's giants, but this is going to be awesome. God's going to slay some giants. This is going to be amazing. And all the other guys are freaked out. Why? Well, Joshua's engaging the presence of God. He's getting to know God in a real way. He knows who God is. The other people are like, you just tell us what to do, Moses. They see the situation, and they're like, um, no. <laughs> that guy's 12 feet tall. I'm good. Like we, I'm, I decided I, I started liking quail and manna. <laughs> We're good. But here's the thing, Joshua, he was qualified. God chose him to lead the people in the promised land. Where are the Joshuas today? Where are the ones that are going to be filled with this presence, filled with this glory, entering a friendship with God, where they start actually bringing people and freedom into the promised land? What's well, the promised land? Everything Jesus paid for on the yes. cross. Yes. Yes. I want that. Yes. 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 I'm done with the wilderness of religion. Mm -hmm. I want. Yeah. I want Him. Mm -hmm. I want to know Him. I want yes. to see Him. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I love this right here. Moses said to the Lord, See, you say, bring this people. You've not let me know who you'll send with me. You, you've said, 
or yet you've said, I've known you by name. I found grace in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray, if I found grace in your sight, show me your way that I may know you more, that I may find grace in your sight. I, I like that he's like, okay, God, I found grace. Show me your way because I want to know you more. So here's the thing. Moses' heart was not set on, I want to just obey you, but I want to know you. I want to know you more. Yeah. Obedience comes out of knowing God. That's it's right. a byproduct. That's right. It's beautiful. So you want to obey God. It's relationship with God. We get to know him and then all of a sudden it just happens. Fruit happens. We start actually obeying right. because we love him. It becomes easy. That's right. But I love that. I love, uh, now therefore I pray, if I found the grace in your sight, show me your way. And right here it says, consider this nation your people. Right here, verse 14. And he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. He's talking about the capital P. Get presence. It's a person. Yeah. It's not this weird mystical force that God just kind of showed. It's God himself. Yes. And he's saying, look, I myself am going to lead you. He did. He did. Don't put your faith in man. Don't put your faith in your own works. Don't put your faith in what you could do for me or your ability to obey me. It's him who does it. It's him who empowers you. It's him who lifts you up. It's him who pulls you through. Right. And in relationship with him, he empowers us to do what we couldn't do that before. So he changes us. He changes our heart. He changes everything. Right. I love Moses' response. They said to him, if your presence does not go with us, don't bring us up from here. Hey. Moses, he's like, yo, look, if your presence doesn't go, if your presence isn't moving here, I don't want anything to do with that. Can we be like that? Can we know God's presence so well that it's like, God, if you're moving, I want everything. I want a part of it. I do not want to be where you're not moving. What if we lived our life that way in every area of our life? <laughs> Like, God, I don't want to work this job if you're not giving me power to work it. If you're not filling me up so I can be a light to everyone around me. If you're not filling me to do this, I don't want any part of it. So good. God, where are you at? I want everything. Amen. I love that. In verse 18, he says, please show me your glory. Boy, actually, let me back up. 16. It says, for then, how will it be known to your people that I found grace in your sight except you go with us? So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people on the face of the earth. Do you notice that Moses recognized it's the presence of God that actually separated Israel from all the other nations? What's the difference between a believer and a non-believer? You have the living God living inside you. Where that was a tabernacle, they followed. You are the tabernacle. That's right. That's right. You are the house of the living God. The Holy Spirit lives in you. That means you're a holy vessel, a carrier of God's presence. How are you separate from everybody else? You carry God. And the world needs God. See, the world was supposed to look at Israel and see the presence of God. They were supposed to see God himself through Israel. The world's supposed to look at you and see God. They're supposed to see what God looks like. They're supposed to see your life being marked with the presence of God. And when they look at you, they're like, what is this? I have to have it. Because it says Christ is the desire of nations. Yes. And then he said, please show me your glory. I love God's response. It says, I'll make my goodness pass before you. And I'll proclaim the name of the Lord before you. Well, what did... What does that mean? So God's glory is connected to his manifest presence actually bringing something into reality, his goodness. Yes. So God's glory is where his manifest presence actually brings his goodness. Yes. Amen. Amen. Does that make sense? Yes. And it manifests his name. God's name is his nature. It's funny how God has constant, he has many names, you know. He says, I'm the Lord who heals you. I'm the Lord who's your banner, meaning he's God who fights for you. Yes. I'm, I'm the Lord, your provider. 
See, him coming and manifesting his name. Remember that passage. He who, believe, he who comes to me must believe that he is. Yes. And he's a rewarder for those who diligently seek him. Yes. God, show me your glory. Show me yes. who you are. Yes, hallelujah. Is this connecting? Is this making sense? Yes. <laughs> Verse 34, 6. The Lord, the God, or the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, for giving inequity and transgression of sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the inequity of the fathers upon the children, children of the father, third and fourth generation. So what do you see there? You see a God who's completely righteous and just, but a God who's loving, merciful, compassionate. What mercy and compassion, it's interesting those two are put together. He's no means clearing the guilty, but he's willing to forgive the guilty. He's willing to, he's in no means like excusing you, but he'll do everything to pull you out of that, to restore you, to break you through from that. You know, I'm convinced part of the judgment of God is allowing you to, allowing the devil to have his way. Like, I believe part of the judgment of God is where you're living in sin and you're living against God. And God said, okay, if you want the devil, this is what he's going to do with you. Have him. Wow. But it's the mercy and love of God that pulls you in saying, hey, I have something so much better. Yes, yes. I got better for you. See, God is amazing. He's wonderful. He's beautiful. And yes. when it's like there's this glory thing that's amazing. when his presence just comes and all of a sudden his goodness, his nature, his character, who he is starts becoming manifest in a room. Then in that place, people start getting healed like without anybody praying for him. It's so funny, we're like witnessing in the park and we came across this girl and I'm like, hey, do you get knee pain? She said, oh my gosh, my knee pain's gone. And then she looks down and she's like, my swelling's gone in my ankle, my swelling's gone in my ankle. And she's freaking out because all of a sudden God just heals her ankle and not, she didn't even say her ankle hurt. It was just God's presence was there, and God's like, hey, let me take care of that. God's a healer. He just yes. does stuff. Right. Here's the thing. We can minister out of anointing. That means God anoints you to do something. Right. That means you pray for something that happens, or we can minister out of glory, and we need to learn how to minister out of both. Yeah. The anointing, you just get filled with the God. You get filled with Him, and He empowers you to do things, like heal the sick, raise dead, all this fun stuff. But there's the presence of God. We engage with Him. And all of a sudden, he shows up and he changes everything around us. Amen. Amen. That's right. It's amazing. Like John, chapter uh, 2. <laughs> you know, the whole Jesus turning water into wine. It's funny how much the religious people hate this passage. <laughs> it was actual wine. It wasn't Kool-Aid or grape juice. Like, it was a party. You, they noticed there was a difference in the wine and fermentation of the wine. But here's something amazing. Wine's, it's symbolic of his blood. You know, there were six water pots which were used for purification. It was a system of works to purify. And what's he doing? When he says, you know, they're like, hey, they're out of wine, Jesus. He said, my time's not yet come. What's he pointing to? Purification. He's pointing to dying on a cross. He's saying, my time's not yet come. So he grabs six vats. Six is the number of men. Yeah. So this is the old system of how man was purified. And he took that and he filled it with wine that symbolizes his blood. A whole new way to be purified. Wow. And they're like, how come the how come the last is better than the first? Wow. The last wine is so much better. <laughs> Why? It's Jesus. It's so much better than the law. <laughs> it's relationship. We get to know him. He's saying this is how you're purified now. <laughs> but in verse 11... 
That wasn't a rabbit trail, by the way. <laughs> it says, the, these beginning signs Jesus did in Cana and manifested his glory. John says, Jesus manifested his glory when he turned water to wine. You have the presence of God coming and changing something in the natural. And John saw that and said, that's the glory of God. So Jesus, this beginning sign, Jesus manifested the glory of God. So everywhere Jesus went, Jesus said, I have manifested your name, talking to the Father. Meaning he brought God's nature, his character, his love. He, everywhere he went, he healed the sick. He multiplied food. He was the provider. He was the restorer. The ones that were broken, the rejected, he became a father to and he came alongside. The ones that were outcasted by society, he went to a well and met with them and said, hey. He manifested God's name. That's right. Just glorious God's presence manifesting his nature. I love this because that glory he gives to you. John 17. I don't pray for these alone, but those who will believe in me. Verse 20. Through their word. So he's not just praying for the disciples. He's praying for you. Yes. What's your name? Huh? Amy? 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 Amy, he's praying for you. He says that. He says, you believe in Jesus? Jesus has actually prayed for you in, in the gospel. It says, I don't pray for these alone, but I pray for Amy who will believe in me through her word. <laughs> or through their word. Listen to this, that they all may be one as you, Father, and me, and I, and you, and they may be one in us. So there's this relationship where not only a relationship with God, but a relationship with each other gets restored. That's right. You know, like, that's amazing. I can't, like, I mean, I can't even begin to wrap my mind around this, but there's something, they're weighty on this, that I'm like, oh, you got to, like, there's more. <laughs> <laughs> that, I love this part it says that the world may believe that you sent me so there's intention of a oneness with each other a relationship restored God is very relational and he invites us into a restored relationship with him and a restored relationship with each other and in this place the world sees it and says there's something different and they start believing in Jesus now listen to this, I love this. And the glory which you gave me, I've given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. <laughs> and the glory which you gave me, I've given to these guys, everyone here, that they may be one, oh wait, just as we are one. What's he saying? It's, it's the glory that actually helps us be one. It's in the presence of God we start sharing each other's heart. You notice that? It's in the presence of God. You notice when, like one thing at Azusa now that was incredible, because like going back to that was the fact that every single person was worshiping the same God from every different denominations. They were one in the spirit singing to the God. Singing in the glory of God. Saying the name of Jesus be lifted high, be lifted high in this land. Yes. Like it was incredible. Like the amount, like you wow. just, like I was bawling, I was crying. I was crying. <laughs> I was crying. <laughs> but I love that. Here's the thing. He gives you his manifest presence and that presence becomes unity. Because there's one spirit, there's one flow, there's one God. And when you start encountering this one God... Now here's the thing, religion divides, it separates. So you go to one congregation, another, there's this division there. Or there's ten churches on one street because they can't get along. Yeah. 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 But when we're after the presence, it's the presence that causes unity. It's the presence, it's the manifest glory of God that actually brings us together as one body. Just as the Father's one with the Spirit, and the Spirit's one with the Father, we start becoming one with each other. We start, you notice when you're worshiping God and engaging His presence, all of a sudden the prophetic starts flowing, and you're just like, man, you start hearing from God. And yeah. how many of you guys have been in worship and had someone come up to you like, hey, I have a word for you? <laughs> Has that any happened to anybody? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Why? 
Come on. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> and the glory which you gave me, I've given to them. Then they may be one, just as we are one. And I in them, and you in me, and they may be perfect in one. That the world may believe that you sent me. So the world is supposed to see the glory of God on your life. He's supposed to, the world is supposed to see the unity and the worship and the glory of God in you. And you being one and expressing the Father perfectly. They're like, what is this? This has to be Jesus. Wow, wow, that's right. Only God could do this. That's right. And when the glory comes, you see the, the nature of God start being manifested. You start seeing people gain healed, people restored, set free, set free from demonic bondage. Holy Spirit just comes and just delivers people. He brings salvation. The words saved, what does that actually mean? Sozo it means healed, delivered, wealthy, prosperous. It has a lot of meanings. None of the meanings actually mean get to heaven and don't go to hell, but that's a part of it too. <laughs> wow. It's... <laughs> when you're saved, it means saved here and now. It means God coming into your life now. God changing you now. God feeling you. It says now is the day of salvation, not tomorrow. Not when he comes back. It's right now. Right. We get it. It's filled with him. Right. <laughs> One day we're going to have new bodies. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to be glowing. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but it says we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so the glory may be of him, not us. It's about the world looking at you in your broken state and where you cannot do anything on by yourself. But you're so dependent on God. God comes. He empowers you in friendship. And then all of a sudden the world's watching God move through you and you're unshakable. You're unbreakable. You're like a tree rooted and grounded in love. And there's nothing they could do to knock you over. And next thing you know, they start seeing the fruit of the tree, the miracles, the love, the, the nature of God becoming manifest through your lives. And they're like, we have to have this because it says Jesus is the desire of nations. Yes. Wow. The world hates religion, but it, it loves Jesus when it's really season. Yes. When people encounter Jesus in a real way, they fall in love with him. How could you not? He is love. And have loved them as you loved me. Do you know God loves you as he loves Jesus? Right there it says that. You know, there's this old Baptist mentality of what Jesus did on the cross. That God doesn't actually see you. He sees Jesus. When he looks at you, he doesn't see you. He, have you heard that? I've heard it, yeah. Yeah, that's horrible. <laughs> See, if that was true, why didn't God just wipe out the world and send Jesus? <laughs> That's so true. Then he could just look at Jesus. Like, God says no lies of the truth, so God doesn't have to lie to himself to love you. <laughs> Jesus wasn't just God's contract to love you. Yeah, yes. It wasn't like, okay, check this out, Father. If I go down there, I die on a cross for them, you, you promise to love them? No. It says for God to love the world, they sent his only begotten Son. Hallelujah. And what that means is when God looks at you, he doesn't just see Jesus in your place. He doesn't see like you moved out, like less of me, more of you. God. That was the old covenant. Yeah. He was saying, God, you have to increase. What he sees is he sees you filled with God. Yeah. He sees you back restored in creation. Yeah. He sees you filled with the Spirit. He sees your original and created value, and that's worth every price. Hey. It's like Song of you know, Song of Songs. Like when when he's talking about the bride, he says, "You're fair, my love. You're fair, my love. You have dove's eyes." Yes. So when God looks at you, he sees a bride filled with the Holy Spirit. That's right. Filled with innocence, yeah. filled with purity, and filled with God Himself. Yes. Yes. See, it's not Christ instead of you. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Yes. But we, and I love that, that we're supposed to be one in him. Yes. I remember 
I prayed. I'm like, God, like what's, what kind of relationship do you want with me? Like what, what relationship, like what's the depth of relationship? Because, you know, like I was just crying and I'm fasting about this. And I'm like, God, I have to know. Like, like how could we know you? What's the depth that we can know you? Like what relationship do you want with me? And he took me to John 14. Where it says in verse 7, if you'd known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you know him and you've seen him. And Philip's like, Lord, show us the father. It's going to be sufficient for us. Just show us who, show us the father. You keep talking about your father. We want to see him. You've been talking about your father over and over and over again. My father this, my father that, show me. Jesus said, have I not been with you so long and you still have not known me, Philip? He who's seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? And when I read that, the Holy Spirit whispered to me and said, that's the relationship I long for with you. Do you realize what Jesus paid for is way more than what we are living? And there's always more because he's infinite. I love that we can be completely filled, but there's always more. What if that was true about the church? What if people, like, their comment about the church is, wow, I see Jesus in them. Like, I remember there was this girl sitting at a bench, and, you know, I walked up, and God just downloaded some prophetic words about her life, and I saw her, like, trying to be strong for everybody else, but having no one to lean on herself. And she was the type of person who felt like she's the strong power and pillar for everybody, but she's no, she, she feels like because she's that, she can't have no one to trust or no one she can lean on that won't fall because everyone's leaning on her. And I saw that, and I told her, I said, Jesus is saying that you can lean on him. That, that he wants you to be able to depend on him and lay on him. She was shocked because that's exactly what she was going through at that time. And she she wrote down my number and she wrote down Josh and Jesus. And then she's like, so I guess I met Jesus today. Oh, wow, 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 wow. That's awesome. I love that because that's, that's a reality. Yeah, and that's for every believer. There's yeah. no one left out. You know, John the Baptist was the greatest of prophets, but Jesus said, you know, after Jesus praised him for being the greatest prophet, he said, guess what? He's the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than him. Wow. Why? Because John the Baptist had the Holy Spirit upon him, but you have Holy Spirit living in you. Wow. Wow, wow. That's right. You are the walking tabernacle of God. Yes. Where you go, Jesus is right there. There's something so real and tangible. I love that because you could actually talk to Jesus anywhere. Your prayer closet doesn't have to be your closet. It's this inner place of communion in your heart where you're daily before God connecting with Him. Smith and Wigglesworth said this. He said, I rarely pray for 30 minutes, but I rarely go 30 minutes without praying. What if we lived our life in communion with God? Where daily we're just talking with him, we're spending time with him, we're we're staying in line, you know, lines long, and we're just praising him in our heart, like God, you're amazing. I want to know you, I want to see you, and we're listening. Like God, and then people around you, like when you're engaging God and you start encountering His presence, people around you start encountering His presence. Yeah. So all of a sudden, people around you, they're like, "What is going on with this guy?" Like it, people get drawn to you. I remember I was walking through the mall and this guy like stands in front of me like this. And, he's just, <laughs> and I look at him and I just pause and there's that weird, it would have been awkward if I didn't feel the presence of God. So like, I'm just sitting there and he's just, I'm sitting there, five seconds goes by and then he's. I'm like, can I pray for you? He's like, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And I prayed for him. He had no idea I prayed for people. He had no idea what I was about. All he knew was that he knew in his heart he needed something I had. Wow. He looked at me and he was just drawn to me. He was like, 
<laughs> and I got to pray over them and bless them and just like love on them. And it was amazing. I don't remember anything from that, but like after that, but like, what if like you actually are the light of the world? <laughs> <laughs> what if people actually look at you and see Jesus? What would that look like? And I love this because, like, it's so not about religion. Yeah. Now, let me explain religion. Religion reads about Jesus and says, okay, we're, you know, Jesus paid for our sins. We're dirty, wretched sinners, so Jesus paid the price. And then they take the New Testament and they make it a law instead of relationship. Where they're like, okay, if I do this and do this and do this and try to be a good person and this and this and this. And they start, you know, they're living out the principles of the Bible. But they have no relationship with God. Right. It's the same thing over again. Yeah. It's the same thing the Old Testament messed up. They wanted the law but not relationship. New Testament, we can't live in that place. That's religion. That's right. That's right. You're made to be filled with God. You're made to become His love. You're made to experience His love. That's right. Yeah. You're made to be in a friendship with God. That's right. <laughs> Jesus, we just thank you for ministering angels that are here tonight. I pray right now that I just see a, an angel actually like chilling. He's like, has this sword and I see a picture of him cutting things off people's hearts. And I see him cutting lies that get ingrained in our subconscious. We may not actually think them, but we feel them, and we don't know how to get rid of them. And one of them is a fear to earn God's approval. Yeah. Like, I feel like there's, there's people who are, approach God, and they're constantly in this place where this fear of God hits them, where they're like, constantly, God doesn't accept me, or there's this underlining tone in their mind where it's almost like they have to work really hard for God to love them. If that's you, raise your hand. Okay, let's cut that thing off. Father, we just thank you in the name of Jesus. That you are loved, you are accepted, you are precious. Just where you are. I thank you, God. There's no work we could do to get you to love us more. That we can't try harder for you to love us more. And the Holy Spirit, I just ask right now for everyone, everyone who struggles with that, that you baptize them in love, a fresh love right now. That you pour that out, Holy Spirit. That you pour out a real, authentic love to where we approach you in intimacy and not works. Where we approach you and we don't work harder to try to get you to do something, but we know you love us and we live from that place. Oh, Jesus, breathe on us, God. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. Okay, I think somebody's arm's getting healed too, so if you have anything with elbow pain, check it and see if it's better. Does anybody get something that goes on with the nerves in there, like right here? Is, is it better? Yeah, come on, Jesus. <laughs> Thank you, God. You're amazing, God. Okay, I have, I feel like there's somebody here too who what's your name again? I met you last time. Leon. Leon, I think this is for you. Let me if it doesn't make sense, like I want real, I want authentic, but I feel like there's been this lie where you feel stuck in an area and it's almost like you have to do your duty here. And it's like there's, it's like almost robbing you of your dreams. Like where you have this dream in your heart where you just feel passionate and you feel cold here, but you feel like you just have to endure here. And you have to stay here. And it's almost like this works. And it's like, I see you like actually holding like a sleigh that's actually chains where you're like pulling this load behind you because you feel cold that you have to pull this load to here when God's saying, hey, you need... There's dreams here. And I feel like God's cutting that off and saying, you're released to dream with Him. You're released to go after your dreams. Yeah. 
nothing holding you back. And as you step in your dreams, it doesn't matter because I feel like God's going to actually pull and give you resources from heaven. I also see a fear of resources like being broken off you where God's going to bring you a new confidence and trusting in Him. Where He's going to blow your mind where all of a sudden things are going to just be released or doors are going to open or you're just going to like... I did never expected that to work that way or this to open. I just see God just saying, I'm the God of the impossible. And like declaring a new name over you that I am the God of the impossible. I am the God of the impossible. And I, I just see freedom to dream with God. I just see a new freedom to say, God, like, <laughs> and it's exciting. It's something like you're, it's, Jesus, does that make sense? Yeah. Hey, Jesus. <laughs> wait, wait. People are laughing. We gotta, we gotta sober up. <laughs> You're supposed to be serious. This is a church, right? God is incredibly joyful. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, wow. And I love that his joy is not dependent on our circumstances. <laughs> like the boat's rocking, you know, like waves crashing against the boat and the disciples are like, we're going to die! Jesus, wake up! And he's like, I'm sleeping. What's going on? Why are you tripping? I said we're going to get to the other side. <laughs> like, why not just believe what I say? I said go to the other side. But the boat's rocking. Well, who cares? You're not getting me. Watch. Peace be still. I remember... For, for a season, my wife and I lived off miraculous provision, like where we saw God provide in crazy ways, like God would show up with rent, God would show up here, people would, someone came up to me in Walmart parking lot and handed me like money we needed for bills, like it was the, but it was the scary place of trusting in God and him showing up at the very last minute, or past my last minute to his last yeah. minute. <laughs> and one day my wife's like, I hate how God always Wait till the last minute. Can't he just show up like sooner? You know, we had two, three weeks before rent's done, and she knows what's going to happen. We're going to stress at the very last minute that it's going to come through. And, and all of a sudden, someone knocks on the door and drops off like two grand. And she's like, God told me to give you this. Wow. wow. You know, the boat's rocking. God said, I'll get you to the other side. But then it's like, Jesus, we're dying. Peace be still. Look. I have authority over this. Trust me. I love how Jesus. I don't. Do you know Jesus was? There is only one thing it says that Jesus was surprised about. He was. He was surprised with amazing faith or amazing doubt. When it said, it said he was shocked, he was, he was surprised at their unbelief. He was shocked at it. He was like, why are these like not believing? Like, paralyzed guy, God, he's baffled. Like, how could they really be in this much unbelief? And he's also impressed with great faith. Yes. Oh, Jesus, hey, don't, don't even come with me. You say the word, my servant's going to be healed. And he says, he's amazed at this great faith. I 
love how I love how the joy of the Lord though doesn't have to stop like when I think that really that I think that actually probably made the Pharisees pretty ticked off too. Jesus is not just hanging out with sinners, but he's joyfully hanging out with sinners. He's laughing with them. But it says the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. Which let me, let me explain the context though. They were worried about the Sabbath and eating meat and fasting and these works. And they're like, hey, like the Gentiles aren't doing it, right? We're doing it this and we celebrate this day. They don't even know there is a day. <laughs> and Jesus is like, look, hey. Paul's like, what, whatever. If you're doing it to the Lord, it's good. If you exalt every day the same or if you exalt one day above the other, if you're doing it to the Lord, it's awesome. If you eat meat or you don't eat meat, you're doing that and connecting to God through it. It's awesome. But he says, guess what? The kingdom of God is not about these works or your doisms or your Christian disciplines, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Righteousness. God made you righteous. It's yours. It's a gift. It's like, here. I want you to have this. He's not like, here, take my righteousness. Just kidding. I just have to hold this up so the Father sees you. He gives you his righteousness. It's a free gift. It's his. He it gives it to you. Peace. Guess what? You have peace with God. You don't have to strive. You don't have to work for His affection. You don't have to do all these hard labors. And if we pray for 10 hours, God's going to bring revival. We just get a rest. Peace. It's the peace of God. It's the tangible presence of God in us where we just rest. And we can have that during a storm. And joy. <laughs> We, one third of the kingdom is joy. <laughs> no. like, I love the fear of the Lord, but I'm not terrified. Like if the Lord, like it's not like a worldly fear. Fears from the devil. No. I fear messing with a power line. You know, I feel like taking advantage of and like sticking my finger in a light socket. You know that? That's a healthy fear to have with God where you're like, don't cross them. You don't go against them because that's, that's going to damage you. But also, it's a healthy respect because, you know, you have power and you have lights. You could see the electric brings something. See, God, we know him as a father. See, my kids, when they mess up, they're like, there's that fear. They're like, oh, no, like I'm in trouble. But they're not so terrified they can't come to me. Yes. Right. But I love that it's not righteousness, peace, and fear, but righteousness, peace, and joy. I love that it says perfect love casts out fear because fear has to do with judgment. Or bondage. Like it depends on translation, but the words it means judgment. It means you being condemned for something. Wow. Wow. Fear has to do with you know you're guilty. You know you have this expectation of something horrible happening. But when you encounter the love of God, it takes away all fear because instead of approaching God, like, oh no, God, I messed up, but yeah. you're like, God, oh, you're amazing, you're my dad, I love you. Yes. And God takes that fear and he places joy in it. He says, Look. You're my son, you're my daughter, and I love you. Oh, wow. Praise God. Yes. <laughs> All right. You know that passage I read where it says, this is my commandment, that you love one another just as I loved you? Yeah. Let's, let's go back to that passage, but let's back up a couple verses, okay? Verse 9. As the Father loved me, so I love you. Abide in my love. Yeah. So abide. That means live. Have your being in. 
We're supposed to live in this place of love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. Do you notice the difference? He says, I kept my father's Torah. I did 613 commandments perfectly. I did every one of those. Now, I did my father's commandments. You do my commandments. If, if you abide in my commandments like I abided in my father's commandments, you will abide in my love. How do we abide in God's love? Keep his commandments. Now listen to this. The very next verse, it says, These things I'm speaking to you, that you, my joy may remain in you, that your joy may be full. Wow. Yeah. Wait, what? <laughs> this is my commandment, that you love others like I love you. Now here's the thing. He slaps joy right in the middle of love and friendship with God. There's something joyful about knowing God who is in his presence is joy. Yeah. That's right, that's right. Yeah, I'm, I'm learning a new way of intercession too. It's called just jo being joyful. <laughs> I like that. It's like, there's this lady who had a thick eyeglasses about that thick and she couldn't read the letters about this big in front of her. And I remember we're praying over her, and my buddy's praying the best prayers, and he's like, you know, quoting all the scriptures, and like, we're, she's getting into it, and we're just like praying really, really hard for her, and nothing's happening, we're not seeing breakthrough. And then she smiles, and she said, I smiled, and my eyes just got a little bit clearer. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, tell her to laugh. Well, laugh, so she starts laughing, and she's like, are you reading, are you reading? She starts reading, and then she starts reading the smaller prayer. Just by laughing, and I'm like, what is going on? I love that joy and holiness are not too like they're not enemies of each other. That's right. It's, we could actually be joyful in a holy moment. That's right. You could be jo completely joyful in God's holiness. Yeah. Come on, it's not like this. You choose one or the other. You could be laugh and be like, or you could be fearful and somber and <laughs> take off your shoes. And yeah. But we could actually be completely in holiness, but completely in joy. That's right. Where they complement each other. That's right. Love that. Beautiful. How do you treat God as holy? You treat him as everything. Where he becomes your everything. He becomes your all-sufficiency. <laughs> Jesus. Like, I love the fact we get a note. This thing really, really is about a friendship with God. Mm -hmm. wow. It's about a relationship. I believe God created man for relationship, for intimacy. He didn't create man because he needed something out of them. He, he created man for intimacy, for relationship. You know, I have a, I have a question. Why do you have kids? Like, what's the point? Why have kids? Well, why would create men? He wanted children. Yeah, that's right. Do you know when you give your life to the Lord and you get born again, it says you are born of God? Yeah. Right. This passage is in John. I'm going to read it. It's, it's like, it's amazing. It says in verse 112, As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. The, to those who believed in his name, who were born not of blood, not of the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Wow, this whole born again thing, it means actually born of God, where God comes in and you actually become uh, connected to him through the Spirit. Right. He lives in you and you actually become a literal, tangible child of God. And guess what? When he comes back, your body is going to reflect that. That's right. That's right. But it starts here. That's right. <laughs> Isn't that amazing?
amazing? Yes. Now here's the thing. God wanted children. Because of sin, his children became orphans. Yeah. They didn't see God as a good father. They saw him as a taskmaster. Yeah. They didn't want relationship with God, so they saw rules and regulations and saw penalty. And they said, that must be who God is. And it's funny because you could actually see their view of God by how they treated other people. You have the Pharisees looking at someone and excommunicating people and saying they're, they're filth, they're scum. We can't be around them. Jesus, do you know what kind of woman is washing your feet? She's soiled. She's messed up. She's dirty. She's damaged. Well, how do you think their view of God was? Through the lens of law and order. Yeah. Law and punishment. But here's the thing. When you're condemned, you can't see God. But when that's taken out of the way, where God says, you know what? I'm taking this commandments. I'm nailing them to the cross with your sin. And I'm giving you a new commandment where you could not just eat of the fruit of tree of knowledge, but you could eat, eat of the fruit of life. Yes. Love. Where you could have life in relationship with yes. me. Yes. Where you could have right. a perfect conscience. It says that in Hebrews, that you could actually have a perfect conscience before God, where you're coming to God without shame or without guilt, or without condemnation. Yes. But you're coming to Him to know Him. Yes. And you're like, wow, I get to know you. It's amazing. <laughs> Jesus. Jesus. Holy Spirit, we want more. I feel like God wants to heal father wounds. How many of you have actually struggled seeing God as a loving father? Let's be real. Jesus died a public death so we could be real about things. <laughs> but I feel like God wants to heal things where we don't, we have a hard time viewing God as a father. He could be our God, He could be our Lord, He could tell us what to do, but a loving Father, you know? God wants children. He wants to give you a spirit of adoption. You're not an orphan. You're not... One day you'll be good enough to fit in with Him. But He loves you right where you're at. So, if... if you want to know God more as a father, let's raise your hand. Let's pray. Yeah, 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 yeah. Father, we repent. Of the idol of feeling unworthy. God, you're a loving father. You are a good father and an affectionate father. So I pray that you break off any area right now in Jesus' name. That you'd come in and crash in with your love and the spirit of adoption. That we'll know the affection of the father. That we'll know you, God. That we'll see you, God. That we will know you as our father in a real way, God. God wants his kids back. Jesus. I thank you also, God. And I just repent on behalf of everybody's fathers who have been abusive, who have been damaging, who has been demanding, who didn't see you and reflect you, God. And I just ask that you would heal any areas damaged, God. And that any, anyone who needs grace for forgiveness, too, with their fathers, God, that you'd release that right now in Jesus' name. There's grace. If, 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 if you struggle with a bitterness or something with family members, with fathers, mothers, if people in your family that have hurt you in the past, where, you know, you, like, and I'm saying, you know, we say we forgive them, but then in our heart, when we think of them, that bitterness comes up. 
If, if you've been struggling with that, I want you right now to say, Father, I forgive. Replace that hurt with your love. <laughs> and Jesus, let's release your joy right now over everybody in this room. <laughs> God, release your presence. God, release more. Jesus, let's release your glory in this room, God. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. Does anybody have ankle pain? Like something to do with their ankles? You do. Can you check your ankles real quick? Like stand up and see if they're better? Huh? Still hurting right now? You got metal bars? Okay, that's going to be fun. You put your hand in the